So what I wanted to do um, for the first half of the talk was to just explain a little bit about what I'm talking about, some of the terminology that's used around um, biomass energy, negative emissions, um, and some of the concepts. And I think it's worth spending a little bit of time going through that, because it's one of those subjects that's quite often banded around, um, but there's not always a lot of explanation around what we're talking about. And then uh, for the main part of the talk, I want to come on and present some of the research that we've done um, across the Tyndall Centre. It's not just my work, this um, looking at some of the challenges and assumptions around BECS to try and understand um, broadly the feasibility of it. And then just at the end, I've got a couple of slides on some new research that we're doing that will hopefully try and address some of the questions that are pro uh, provoked um, in the early part of the talk and then try and end with a few concluding remarks. So the background to this, I'm sure you're all familiar with um, the Paris Agreement from 2015, which moved the aspiration from a two degree temperature rise um, up to a one and a half degree temperature rise. So this is a global temperature rise since pre-industrial times. You can see from here that we're already pushing one degree. So to get to one and a half degrees, we're kind of approaching that barrier already. So that's, that's the kind of background to what we're looking at and how tight the target of one and a half degrees is. And some of the concepts that are involved relating to that, when we try to relate um, global temperature to uh, our emissions, we come into the concept of something called a carbon budget. I'm sure most people in the room will be familiar with this, but just to, for those who aren't. So if we, emit, if we carry on emitting CO2 or greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, those gases build up, up to a certain amount over a given period of time that can be related to an average temperature rise. And this is known as our carbon budget. To relate that back to emissions um, as we go along in, in time, we use something called an integrated assessment model. And these are the main models that feed into the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change negotiations, the policy negotiations, um, sometimes quite controversial, but these are the models that, that link on a global scale our energy, economy, land, climate into a single framework and generate possible emission scenarios that could be compatible with a carbon budget that's associated with a govern. <laughs> temperature rise. And if that budget is exceeded and we can't bring emissions down low enough to, to maintain our carbon budget, the models use something called negative emissions. And that's mainly what I'm going to be talking about today. So who's, can I just have a quick show of hands? Have people heard of negative emissions, familiar with negative emissions? Okay, so everybody um, knows about the concept of negative emissions. To relate those to carbon <laughs> budgets, this is a graph um, that my colleague Kevin Anderson um, has put together in a paper with Glenn Peters. Um, this is actually relating to two degrees, but it, the same principles apply for one and a half degrees. The black line here is our net carbon emissions. The pink is our positive emissions that are going on um, projected into the future. If those positive emissions go above uh, um, aspirational net line, then we introduce net negative emissions within the model. And these balance each other to reduce the line. Where the line goes below zero, you can see that the net amount of negative emissions um, that we're generating is greater than the positive emissions. And then we come into an area that's called global net negative. So that's when the amount that we're removing from the atmosphere is greater from the amount, than the amount of emissions that we're putting into the atmosphere. So how do we do that? So we do that um, in the models. There's lots of different ways, different um, so-called negative emission technologies. The one I'm going to talk about today is biomass energy with carbon capture and storage. The reason we're focusing on this one here is because that's the one that's used to greatest extent in the models. It's potentially the nearest to commercial deployment. It's not at commercial deployment, and I'll, I'll come on to that later on. Um, but the others are much more experimental, the other approaches. And I can talk a little bit about those, but this is where my area of expertise is. The other approach that's used within the models is something called afforestation, which is where you put in managed forests where previously there were no managed forests and you use the trees as a carbon sink. And that's something else I won't be talking about today, but that's another way of removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere that is included in the integrated assessment models. So the basic idea of carbon capture and storage um, has come out of the fossil fuel um, processes. So the idea there being that you burn a fossil fuel, coal, oil, gas in a, a power station, oil refinery, some sort of energy conversion facility. You then scrub the flue gases or change the way you combust those fossil fuels and capture the carbon dioxide to prevent it being emitted into the atmosphere. You then compress it, pipe it, transport it to um, a storage reservoir, which is typically a geological formation. In the UK, all the potential CO2 storage would be located offshore. 
By that we mean below the seabed, so not in the marine environment at all, but it's injected in a, a, an injection well similar to the sorts of wells that we use to extract gas into a geological formation. This is not to scale, this distance here is around a kilometre, so it's very well below the seabed. If we then start looking at, at what, how we introduce BECs into the equation, instead of using a fossil fuel feedstock, you would use a biomass energy feedstock. The idea being here that the biomass energy absorbs CO2 from the atmosphere by the process photosynthesis. That's accumulated in the, the, the feedstock. You then take that to your conversion facility and capture the CO2, burying the CO2 underground. You then effect, effect, effectively remove the CO2 from the atmosphere via the biomass. So the biomass takes it up, you then bury it down. Um, I'll illustrate that schematically here. So this is our biomass feedstock. It's a very simplified diagram, obviously, um, into your energy conversion facility and your storage. Along the way here, there will be losses. There'll be fossil fuel own use. You've got tractors to drive. You've got pipelines to run. You've got machinery in the processing and the harvesting of the biomass energy. So there'll be lots of emissions along the way, as, long as, the, the C, as well as the CO2 coming down into the biomass energy. The CO2 stored, which is a, a figure that you often see quoted, so the reason I'm showing you this is to show some of the terminology that's used around um, BECs and negative emissions. But if we're looking at CO2 storage, that's not negative emissions. That, across this supply chain, is just the bit that you're capturing in storage. If you want to talk about negative emissions from a BEC system, you need to look across the whole system, from where you grow your plants to where you storage, and look at the, across the whole supply chain to ensure that that is all negative. You can then increase... Um, the scale of those projects and, and, ex, and sort of expand them on a global scale, add them up, have lots of projects, and then have a total neg negative emissions that's come out of all your um, different supply chains, different projects. To go into global net negative, so that's that hashed area on the graph I showed you where your, your negative emissions is greater than your positive emissions, the amount you're removing with your BEX plants has to be greater than all the other anthropogenic emissions. And that's when we're in global net negative territory, when you're actually removing more um, than you're taking. So how does this relate to our carbon budgets? So one way that you can use BECs and negative emissions or other negative emissions technologies is to offset so-called hard-to-abate sectors. So as you reduce your emissions, we do all the mitigation we possibly can, the idea is there's probably likely to be some residual emissions left. There's certain sectors that are much harder to abate um, than other sectors, for example, aviation and um, agriculture. And for those sectors, there's fewer technical options. Electricity is classic. You can convert to renewable energy. You can decarbonise that relatively easier, easily. Aviation, much harder to abate. Reducing the demand for some of these also will encounter social and political challenges, and there's likely always to be some residual emissions. So in this case, you could feasibly use carbon dioxide removal or negative emissions um, to balance those hard-to-abate sectors. More controversially, um, you might have noticed on that graph I showed that we've got an overshoot. So the graph shows that the, the carbon budget going down. The declared contributions from the Paris Agreement, what, what countries have promised to um, reduce by, is already slightly above that budget. So the idea being here that we could use BECs if we have an overdraft on our carbon budget to pay it off later, essentially, by removing carbon dioxide at a greater level in the future. And you can see why this is then becoming controversial. There's lots of uncertainties around that, around the magnitude and the timing of that overshoot, whether BECs can deliver. Um, so in that sense, it becomes a controversial um, topic. But what I'd like to stress here, and what's often confused, and I'll probably say this lots of times during this talk, and I apologise for that, is negative emissions is not an alternative to mitigation. If you're getting, talking about global net negative emissions, that can't happen without radical emission reductions. You will never get to global emissions territory if you carry on as we're doing now. It is not an alternative, and I will probably come back to that several times. You'll still need your radical emissions. So where does this fit within... Um, the, the policy and the negotiations and our future scenarios. So there's a recent intergovernmental panel on climate change special report on one and a half degrees, looking at the ways in which we might reach one and a half degrees that uses emission scenarios that come out of integrated assessment models. Every single one of those pathways uses some recourse to negative emissions or carbon dioxide removal. 
whether that's BEX or whether it's afforestation, every single scenario to one and a half degrees in the IPCC special report uses negative emissions. It's there, in there. There has been some research looking at how we can um, approach one and a half or two degrees without negative emissions and BEX at a large scale. Um, my colleagues here at the Tyndall Centre, led by Alice Larkin, have got a, a paper looking at if we don't get large scale BECs, what would be required, particularly from the big emitting countries, how much would they have to cut their emissions down? And they show the level of ambition and how difficult that would be. It would need very ambitious, immediate, radical emission reductions. Detlev van Voren, the middle paper here, um, they, these are uh, one of the integrated assessment modelling teams, have done some model runs to look through and see um, if they can make the models deliver one and a half degrees without large scale BECs. They all still have afforestation in there and they do show some of the challenges involved in terms of behavioural change, demand side reductions. At the moment it can still just about be made to work but um, it, not without no negative emissions at all. And finally on, on those papers, a paper by another colleague at Tyndall at UEA um, is looking at sort of innovative social innovations, um, uh, in, social innovations of ways of reducing demand in, in ways that have not been thought about quite so much before to sort of explore that space of demand reduction um, without using just technology. Okay, so now we come on to the research. So this is a, a, an a, a accumulation of, of several research projects and research that I've done with many of the people who are in this room across Tyndall. It's not just my research. Well, we've tried to look at some of the challenges and some of the assumptions that um, are associated with BECs, particularly in the use of how they're used in integrated assessment models. So under the AVOID program, um, which um, Professor Jason Lowe talked about a couple of weeks ago, we, took to, we had a, a proper look at some of the, the model results and tried to identify what some of the key uncertainties and assumptions were. And some of these are implicit in the models and some of these are, are explicitly represented in the models. But we didn't want to just restrict to what's in the model boundaries to try and look at how, actually what the tacit assumptions are around BECs. And we've come up with a set of nine or so um, assumptions. And I'll go through each one of these and try and think of, use some of the, the work that we've done um, to try and look at the, the, the actuality of the, these assumptions and challenges. And across all of them, the issue is scale. You know, I talked about whether, when you start building up more and more projects, the more projects you have, the larger scale, the larger amount of negative emissions you need, the more these problems come to the fore and the more challenging it becomes. So it's not a, an all or nothing case. So to explain what I mean about the scale and what sort of scale we're talking about, um, I've just drawn this plot of the amount of carbon capture and storage that's assumed in some of the um, model runs towards one and a half degrees. So we worked with the image modelling team and they produced us some special um, scenarios. They ran some scenarios before the IPCC report was out to look at different ways of reaching one and a half degrees and gave us access to some of the data that's quite difficult to find out what the models are actually saying, what the outputs are. So this is our current carbon capture and storage. It's about 40 million tonnes. This scale up here is in gigatons of CO2. So it barely registers on this scale of what's being used at the moment. The blue blocks are our fossil CCS. So all these scenarios, they use a mixture of fossil CCS and biomass CCS. The biomass part is the orange part. So you can see in 2030, that's where the first plants with any BEC start to come online. So to put that into context, um, the recent uh, Carbon Capture, Storage and Utilisation Cost Challenge Task Force commissioned by uh, the UK government is looking towards establishing commercial plants in the UK at 2026. So there are a handful of CCS plants at the moment on fossil. There's one BEX plant that's operating at the moment in America. BEX is not established. CCS is there to some extent, but it's by no means a commercially widespread technology. By 2030, it's talking about ramping up a bit. That seems fairly reasonable. By 2040, so that's only in about 12 years' time, we're looking at coming up to 300 times the amount of CCS that we've got at the moment combined, the BEX and the CCS. And if you move out to 2100, it's almost 700 times the amount of CCS that we've got around at the moment. Admittedly, that's from a very small scale, but you can see <clears throat> how the models are ramping up this technology. And that's the backdrop um, to what we're looking at. Back to my point about not being an alternative to um, 
radical emissions reduction. On the same scale, this is where we are now. This is our global annual um, CO2 emissions. Taking away the fossil component of the CCS and just plotting the BECS component, you're not in global ne negative territory until this starts pushing below the line. So you've got to have the amount above is your positive emissions. As you push that down, you get to about there, you're in break-even territory, net, um, net zero. And then as it pushes down, you're in net negative. So net negative will not happen um, without radical emission reductions if we stay where we are now. That's the second time I've mentioned that. OK. Um, right, so what does that mean to in terms of delivering this level of um, biomass energy CCS? Well, you've got to get your biomass from somewhere. You've got to have um, enough resource to supply that. And that will be distributed globally. No one country is going to produce its own biomass needs. You've got to, then you've got quite complex supply chains. Your biomass is likely to be grown in a different place to where your carbon is being, uh, your biomass is being burnt and potentially stored. So you've got potentially global supply chains introducing global trade in these commodities. So that introduces lots of challenges in terms of the, the, the technical and specification of the feedstocks, the, 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 the processing, the regulatory issues, and of course the geopolitical issues can't be underestimated. You also need to pay attention to your sustainability issues when you're using land for different purposes, your competition, what's happening to the, um, the, the people who use those lands. And you need to make sure that you're not making other things worse as you're addressing your um, climate mitigation, particularly biodiversity, the social implications um, of these issues. So what we've done in another project um, that was funded by Bayes is we've actually taken those model runs and tried to relate some of the assumptions around um, that I've listed before and relate those to the real world, to relate those to the literature and what we know about these things. So looking at how much biomass is, um, is involved in these scenarios and what the land use requirements are, the, the maximum amount of land use for BECs in a one and a half degree scenario in image was about 500 million hectares which is roughly 4% of the global land area. It's roughly the size of um, the, the land mass of the EU, um, as it is. <laughs> um, OK, and roughly half of that is from, made up of residues. We're getting biomass. It's not all new energy crops. It's roughly 50-50 energy crops and residues. And of those energy crops, uh, image uh, uses about 20, defines about 26 different regions, and it's roughly 12 of those regions that are growing most of the bioenergy. But only a third of those are in areas that we might describe as having well-established governance frameworks. So when you're thinking about the sustainability, you're thinking about having a close handle on, on where your biomass is coming from. Um, that's something to look at. Uh, except that this is the modelled world. This is not how it would actually happen. This is just a scenario to show how it could pan out. So the storage. So that's our biomass feedstock. Where are we going to put the CO2? OK, so roughly um, half of the storage is spread across five of the regions. In these five regions, the Russia, Mexico, it depends on which scenario you're looking at. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and we looked at, we compared those figures for the regional storage estimates for all of those regions and found, with the exception of Russia, it was actually a pretty good match. We weren't going close up to the, to the edge of those storage requirements. But there's not a lot of assessment of the storage potential in Russia. We really don't know how much storage potential there is in Russia. To contrast with that, in just the US and China, it's only 10% of the estimated capacity. So we're not filling up our reservoirs by any means. Big caveat to that, though, um, is that these regional assessments are not always very well worked out. They're, they're based on an effective potential, a theoretical potential. Different regions, different countries have got a much better understanding of their storage capacity. Um, and you would, before you would ever even think about storing CO2 in a, in a formation, you would have to properly assess it and, and map it and really understand the properties and the potential um, for storage. In the UK, uh, through the oil and gas industry, we've got a very good handle on our storage potential. We're very well placed with the North Sea, um, and those reservoirs are very well understood, um, and in several other countries as well. So then we look at the social responses. This is a really massive area. Clearly, it's not well represented in the model, but any sort of large-scale um, introductions of these types of technologies um, will have a social implication. And the societal response can also have an, Im uh, an impact on the success of those technologies. As CCS, a new technology, um, has been started to be introduced, we've seen 
a variety of responses from local communities, from host communities. And we've seen how in some famous cases, such as the Barendrecht case in the Netherlands, um, how that can actually prevent a project being established. But in other places, there's been quite more sympathetic reactions. Um, you can't just extrapolate from all um, areas and predict what's going to happen, but you can manage that process and improve um, how you implement it, do it in a much more procedurally um, beneficial way um, that's fairer um, and, and try to avoid some of those projects problems. And that's, that's something we've done quite a lot of work of here in the Tyndall Centre. And again, thinking back to scale, it's going to be much easier to introduce gradually. If you're trying to rapidly ramp up this new technology, you really need to think about the social implications of that. And from the biomass side, if you've got anything that, that's going to compete for your land use and you're talking about this, um, changing land use and diverting land to crops away from um, food, potentially for energy crops away from food, that could have implications. There was a report out this, earlier this week from the um, Committee on Climate Change raising some of just those issues, people talking about, are we going to have to all be vegetarians? These are the sorts of issues that have a massive implication and can't just be represented in a model mapping technology. We've got complex supply chains, the people on the ground that are making this happen. Um, multiple stakeholders, different farmers, different people that have to work together to get that biomass from the ground to a carbon storage site. And that's all going to have lots of different social factors as we go along. And then at the bottom here, I've put these slightly separate because this is about the people in the here and now delivering the technology. There are some bigger social issues, particularly ethical issues around BEX. Um, and there's something called moral hazard. So mo the basic idea of moral hazard is when one group of people agrees to take on a risk, whereas the risk impacts will affect another group of people. So in case of negative emissions, we as a society are saying, it's OK, we can exceed our targets, we can exceed our carbon budget, because we can have negative emissions in the future, we can suck the CO2 out of the air. If that doesn't work, if Bex fails to materialise, if it doesn't work as expected, you've got what's called a moral hazard. So you're expecting future generations to incur um, the implications. But you could also have a reverse moral hazard. If we've shown how important the, the, the prospect of negative emissions is to, to reach one and a half degrees, even with the best wind in the world, it's still incredibly challenging. And we don't invest in BEX, and we don't try and explore its potential. Are we then exposing more risk to future generations by not um, pursuing these technologies? That's a question I'll leave handily. I don't have the answer to the question, but it, it's just something to inform our thinking. OK, policy frameworks. How do we make it happen? At the moment, we don't have enough of a global climate policy to ramp out a new technology at this scale on a global level. We've got the Paris Agreement as a huge step forward. All the countries of the world initially signed up to it. Some dropped out, but well, one dropped out. Um, <laughs> But that's, the, that's just the very starting point. And you can see the challenge if you want to do global scale net negative emissions. You've got to have a global climate framework in place. And you'll need incentives. This isn't going to happen unless somebody makes it happen. Whether that's through a carbon price, whether that's through incentive, a mixture of all sorts of things. You'll need some sort of um, mechanism to encourage this technology to be developed. If you do get it developed, how do you allocate your emissions? Who gets the credit? Is it the people who grow the biomass? Is it the country who stores the CO2? How do you allocate those emission reductions across countries in a global climate agreement? I've talked already about um, the sustainability implications. We've got sustainable development goals. You need to make sure that your climate goals and your sustainable development goals work in, um, in tandem in a way that doesn't compromise um, other issues such as biodiversity and conservation. And then you need to monitor, you need to be sure that your system is negative along the way. And you've got liability considerations. If you're storing CO2 for potentially centuries, then what happens if there's a failure in that? How do you remediate it? Um, whose responsibility is that? And there's quite a lot of work being done on that. It's not an insurmountable problem, the liability, but it's just something that needs to be considered. OK, so I've talked about the monitoring and the verification. This is the key question. How do we know we're genuinely net inevited? We've talked about a supply chain. There's losses that you go all the way along that supply chain. Um, you need to make sure that you're actually delivering negative emissions. Otherwise, there's no point in doing it. 
you've got multiple stages. I've listed some of them here from the plant to the storage site. And the best way to do that is to take what's called a life cycle approach, a life cycle assessment approach to look at the greenhouse gas emissions along that supply chain. You can also look at the other implications, um, other, other um, emissions, the water implications, if you use this life cycle approach. And in principle, you can look at points along the chain and look at the social implications as well. But we're still working on new methodologies for doing this on an accurate way. And it's something that colleagues at the Tyndall Centre is also working on a lot, at, at looking at different methods for life cycles. Just to add to that, I should say that that's not the approach the integrated assessment model use, and I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, is they do account for the emissions, but that all gets lumped into the energy system. So your tractor goes into your transport system in the models. Um, this is a slightly kind of um, detailed assessment, but if you're, tight, if you're looking at um, your definitions and your stories, these things come, become important when you're trying to unpack the assumptions and the outcome, outputs of the models. Um, so we're not there yet with the LCA, but that we think is, is the way forward. So just to summarise what I've said, um, based on our work on the global assumptions around BEX, before I move on to our um, forward-looking research, we are talking about a huge scale of ambition with our global net negative. And it will depend on global emission reductions. It's not an alternative. Is that number three? I don't know. Um, and the challenges are not all technical. There are some technical challenges, but the consensus among the engineering community is that these are not the key thing, that they're not unsurmountable challenges. We can make this technology work. The barriers to why it hasn't been introduced are not technical. They're to do with um, policy and um, those sorts of frameworks and governance frameworks of making um, the technology happen. And we've seen that the model results that come out of IMAGE are within the bounds of the literature assessments and for individual assumptions. However, there's not always great empirical data. We haven't got full supply chains to look at at this. And that's something we are looking at as well, is looking at what can be represented in the model, what it's reasonable to expect the model to improve on, the models to improve on, and what it's not, what conversations should be happening outside the model. So you take your model results, but you still talk about these things um, as well, and they, they need to, to not be kind of pushed to one side. So looking towards new research, um, so the research councils in the UK have just uh, last year launched an £8 million research R&D programme on negative emissions, looking not just at BEX, but looking at all the negative emissions technologies. Um, there's four large consortiums involved um, that have been funded through that process. Um, I'm part of one of those with, with my colleagues in the other universities here. And the project is called Feasibility of Afforestation and BEX for Greenhouse Gas Removal. Fab GGR, and that's about, we're about a year in to this project. So I'll just tell you some of the sorts of things that we're looking at in that project. So it's about real world feasibility of large scale afforestation and BEX. So we're actually looking about what would it look like? What are the implications? How could it be ramped up at scale? And to do that, we're looking at life cycle emissions across different supply chains, um, in, mainly in the UK to look at the detailed numbers and the sorts of performance we might get out of those supply chains. And we're also looking up at a wider global scale to look at the implications if these sorts of supply chains were implemented on a global level. And then to that effect, we're also looking at the, um, the implications to ecosystem services, looking at economics and policy at, a, at a, uh, a UK scale. So we're looking up and down the scales across these supply chains. And we're also looking at those difficult social and governance related uncertainties. So part of that will be look at specific pinch points along the supply chains and looking at, at talking to farmers, talking to, to people that will be responsible for making these supply chains happen. Um, and bringing all of that together. Um, so, so far I've only talked about BEX as if it's a single thing. BEX is not a single thing. There's lots of different routes into delivering biomass energy with CCS. The approach we've taken in this project is we've identified four supply chains. There's three listed here. There's a fourth one, which is afforestation, which I haven't included on this slide. That's a slightly different um, type of supply chain. And we've come at these uh, in consultation with stakeholders across um, the academic policy NGO communities to say what would be the most interesting to look at and the most sensible supply chains to really pursue using our methodologies. So we've come up with these four that we're going to look at in much more detail. We've got a, a UK large-scale electricity generation using forestry residues from North America, mentioning no names. Um, 
we've got one looking at energy crops on a, on a medium scale, looking at combined heat and power in the UK, with a variation where we replace our energy crops with um, a feedstock uh, <coughs> using straw residues. So this is a stylized supply chain, and we're taking a sort of modular approach. And so these variations will just take out one of these modules and look at the implication of different, in this case, in different feedstocks. And in our third case, we're looking at um, a more novel technology for carbon capture, looking at pre-combustion, where you capture that you gasify your feedstock and take the CO2 out before um, it gets to the tailpipe. And with that, you produce a hydrogen-rich gas, which you can easily use to generate electricity, or you can use it to, in our variant to, to use hydrogen, which is then um, injected into the gas grid and potentially useful in heat networks. So hopefully you can see the flavour of the sorts of things that we're talking around with BEX. Um, and how we're looking at those. So just to summarise, I don't want to leave you all thinking it's all negative, it's all too much of a problem, we're never going to be able to do this. So I thought, I was trying to think of some ways, um, if, if we do want to look at Bex, if we are thinking about that reverse moral hazard, hazard notion, how would we go about that? So the first thing is to get a better demonstration programme. We need to start trying this technology out, seeing if we can make it work, looking at the problems, how to solve those problems. And those, that shouldn't just focus on the technical. We need to look at the political and the social, the ethical, the governance problems by actually trying to do this technology on a demonstration scale. Is this number four? As part of an ambitious process to reduce your, your emissions, it's not an alternative to reducing your emissions. It really still needs um, those carbon emissions um, mitigation programmes to be carried on at full, at full speed. And then as you start making gains and start demonstrating this technology at national or project levels, then you can start scaling up, potentially to deliver the, your global negative emissions, potentially global net negative emissions. But if you want to do that, you're going to have global coordination across these complex supply chains. You're going to need government mechanisms to deliver this on a global scale. And we're talking very different frameworks to those that we've got today. And there's quite a bit of work going on around this, but we're not there yet. Potentially around multi-level governance scales, looking at across different scales. But you're also going to need to finance it and develop a lot of new infrastructure projects. This is, a, is quite a big undertaking. I think I've probably made that point quite well now. Um, so these are some of the, the, the routes that we, we could think of to deliver our negative emissions. If you want to read more about it, this is quite a whistle-top store about, around a complex subject with a lot of material that's come from a lot of different um, research. There's a, a book. Here is the book that we've uh, edited at the Tyndall Centre, which looks across... It looks at the different technologies on an engineering basis. It looks at how those might fit into an energy system. And it also looks at some of the, the kind of harder social um, and political challenges around BEX. We've also got some, uh, a, a collection of papers as well to go into further detail. Sorry, I finished a bit early. I thought I'd be longer. I thought I'd overrun, but I've underrun. I'm sure there's loads of questions because there's a lot that's embedded behind all of that. Thank you.